Indie Opera celebrates our 10th anniversary and our brand new status as a 501c3 organization. You can help us make the future of opera brighter and bolder for the next 10 years with a tax-deductible gift today. Donate on our website, Facebook, or on Patreon for special benefits. Welcome to the Indie Opera Podcast. Happy anniversary, Indie Opera Podcast. Congrats on making it down the long and traveled road for 10 years and counting. Here's to many more. Happy anniversary, Indie Opera Podcast. Congratulations to everyone there. Uh, my name is Deborah Brevort, and I uh, had the great pleasure to talk with Chuck last year about the opera that I wrote with composer Mishi Wianko called Murasaki's Moon. Since then, I've been doing quite a lot of opera. I was part of the Decameron Opera Coalition uh, and was commissioned by Fargo Moorhead Opera to write a segment for that series with composer Michael Ching. It was all based on Boccaccio's Decameron. It was big fun. Uh, I also just finished work on The Knot with Alexandra Vrebelov, which will premiere at Glimmerglass this summer. Thanks to um, all of you there for everything you do and keep the podcast coming. Happy anniversary. 10 years. Please join me to congratulate and celebrate the 10 years anniversary of Indie Opera Podcast for this amazing and wonderful journey you have come. I still remember our first episode. Nine years ago, I talked about Dr. Sun Yat-sen, my first opera, and also an American soldier. So many years passed by, and you are always there to support us composers, to create new work, to spread the words. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, and today we celebrate you, and happy anniversary, and may many, many amazing 10 years more to come. Hello, Indie Opera Podcast. This is Royce Fabric wishing you the most amazing anniversary. Um, here's to many, many, many more. Welcome to the 10th anniversary of the Indie Opera Podcast. This is Peter. This is Ashley Renee. This is Greg. This is Walker. This is Brooke. And this, this is, is no, no. <laughs> this is Chuck. There we go. That was Chuck. And we're joined by. <laughs> I Noah knew that would fail. We tried. I knew of, that would fail. There's a lot that of people. Was, we could. That was my it. fault because I had that like mic for a second of silence, and I was like, "Oh, they're all waiting for well, me." I'm jumping. like stuck. Process of elimination. Why don't we this do it like again? No, we're stooges. not doing this again. We're oh, going like the three stooges, <laughs> except it's like the seventeen stooges. No, I, this is, since it's our tenth anniversary, I want people to know how stupid we are. So we're gonna go on. We're joined by Noah Lethbridge, music teacher, opera nut, stand-up comic before COVID nineteen, co-founder of this podcast. And father now. Welcome to the show, Noah. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think I'm still a comic. I just don't know what to do with it because uh, there's no mics. I mean, there are there were a couple in the park. I did those. <laughs> That's an exercise in humility. Um, before um, we, we get deep into our conversations, <laughs> I wanted to do a couple thank yous. I want to thank okay. everyone who uh, came and watched our show live on Facebook when we did the Jonathan Ho John Holiday uh, episode. We have had over 800, I think 880 people on Facebook have watched it now, which is really wonderful. And I want to thank everyone who tuned in for that. It's a great show. And if you want to see it, it is on Facebook on our on our Facebook page, as well as our YouTube page. Um, and if you want to find it, um, all you have to do is go to our homepage, which is IndieOpera.com. And please remember when you're on Facebook or uh, like us on Facebook and on YouTube, give us a thumbs up and subscribe to us. Or if you're listening on in, um, iTunes, subscribe there and please give us a rating. It would be really cool to, you know, just say hi in the rating, say whatever you want. So the rankings and visibility and whatever, right? So, you know, if you like us, you want other people to listen to us, 
And it's almost like donating to us because it gives our show a little kick. And I want to thank everyone who has, who, who has donated. So we've raised about $610 on my birthday thing. And I, right. so I set a new goal of 800 or something like that. But uh, it would be really cool if you if you see my birthday thing on Facebook, donate a little. It would be really great. And we're a nonprofit now. It's completely uh, tax deductible. You can also donate on... Um on our website or through PayPal, uh, you can become a patron on Patreon. Um, so there are myriad options available to you. And if you would rather mail us a check, send us an email and we'll tell you how to do that. At comments at indieopera.com. Um, and gosh, we never actually did that kind of a, a chatter before our show, but no. we no, just tried it. Better than announcing our names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's way more interesting. Yeah. <laughs> and so Noah, it has been quite, quite a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. So I don't you, know how long, three years? But you had your kid. Who cares? I, I have, my kid is five. So it was my kid's going to be that. six oh my uh, next month. You should start yeah, a, comedy, a comedy podcast of your own. Um, I don't know. The thing about being an open mic, a lowly depressing open mic comic, which was my fa- one of my favorite things to be in life, is that you need mics. You need mics to do that. You need mics so that you can do bar shows so that nobody can watch you. And, and you just, it's like an addiction and all of my, uh, like all of my veins are gone, you know, like I can't get a hit. So I'm like, I got to figure this out. Like I've been doing other things. I'm like, I'm reading and I'm writing and I'm writing jokes and stuff. But I'm like, I just, I'm writing really stupid songs. And I'm like threatening that I'm going to put these songs, these dumb songs on YouTube. And like, I'm going to do something stupid pretty soon because I'm getting (laughs) artistically desperate. (laughs) Is is, is anyone doing like stand up on Zoom? Is that, is that a thing? Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. If you can, if you can think of a human activity, it's happening on Zoom. It's, it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, I watched a stand-up lab on Facebook. Uh, recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And my bestie, my bestie's a stand-up comedian too, Noah. So that's cool. Who? Um, what? We have those conversations often about what, what, what the heck do you do? <laughs> what do you do? No, you know what? Like, I don't mean to make it sound like people can't do it. People are doing it. I've tried to do it during the pandemic and I don't get the hit from it. For me, it's the fear. Like I got off in the fear and I just don't feel that scared in front of a computer. I'm like, <laughs> oh, here, here's my joke that's bad. And then you don't care. You know, it's just that it's you not the same. You gotta do live, like so, live, so live, with people watching you. You gotta do it like live. You know, you to, to, Ashley, I'm gonna try it because you, you, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna try it because it's like, I, <laughs> You know, I mean, when 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 we all kind of pretended like COVID didn't exist this summer, there was um, open mics in the park, and that was fun. But it's not this. It's not the same. Yeah. You know, it's like I need dirty, dirty club, desperate people, young kids who think they're gonna make it, old people who are never gonna make it. Like I, I don't know. I'm, I'm like I'm getting nostalgic and and weird. I'm gonna figure it out. But thank you for your for your. I support. feel like COVID has made it all <laughs> a little weird. Like I've struggled with my own. Yeah output absolutely first week of my wheelchair literally physically broke so i was sitting in my manual wheelchair in front of the window to the door on the balcony and i said to a friend of mine who came over to watch the one and i said to him that I am one bonnet away from being every disabled character in a Dickens novel ever. That's a lot of characters. Uh, I was like, just a little bonnet, and I could be like, Miss Habersham or something, you know? Miss like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that sounds like a... Um, yeah, the, the other thing is I, you know, I'm a teacher and I've been doing a lot of Zoom teaching, which is like about as much fun as, I don't know, getting t- teeth pulled. Like, it's, it's not, it's awful, you know? So the idea of like doing that all the time and then trying to do comedy over it, it's like, I don't know. There's something about Zoom that's, that, 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 that I identify with, like, uh, just yelling at 
eight-year-olds to turn their cameras on. I just want to know sure. because I totally empathize. I work with kids on Zoom and I just had okay. the most awkward like music session. I was like, it's going to be cool. I got my mic ready. We're going to write some tunes and like write some songs to go. Do your kids turn on the camera? Some of my kids do really well. Like some of my kids are on it. They just go like, okay. And they kind of go with it. And I think it's not a lot, but there are some that are really good, you know? And there are some that just, you just, I mean, I'm not going to use the student's name, but I have a student who. Tell us their whole he, name. Tell every, us their real I, names. I, his, his name is, are you ready? I'm going to George Washington. Okay. So George Washington. <laughs> <laughs> every time we have class I give them something that is like essentially a deliverable because I need them to do something <laughs> not busy work but something that they actually have to do in order to kind of get a buy-in to, to feel like they're invested you know so it could be very easy it could be like we're, doing, we're playing a game called poison rhythm it could be like write a four beat poison rhythm which would take them not very long uh -huh. this kid is like allergic to pencils and paper I'm like, all right, let me, George Washington, uh, can I, can I see your paper? Will you hold it up for me so I can see your work? And he's like, Mr. Mr. No, I didn't do it. You know why? Because you could just do it in your mind. Like, that's his thing. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I just can't. Oh. Right, so I know that George Washington can do it. I mean, he was the first president <laughs> oh, of our country. Yeah, he so can do it. He can handle it. Yeah. He yeah. can handle writing for <laughs> notes. The other thing that I'm sympathetic to is like, I, I, I prefer to do everything in my mind. I'm super lazy and uh, get well, away but, with my. But you're kind of like it. Mozart. I mean, you you you. I mean, you compose like entire operas in your head, don't you? No, I don't know what you're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> <laughs> more than his credit, he wasn't as much of a talented prodigy as we would think, and so he just. Uh, Resident musicologist here being the resident musicologist. Mozart had a really good publicist, really. Yeah, but yeah, Mozart <laughs> yeah. had some, I think they about notebook that his father wrote for him more. So Mozart's not, wasn't as much of a prodigy as we initially well, thought? Well, it really was, but they found some Notebook that was docked by Leopold. Oh, I bet. Oh, I bet. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, he was. He was. Um. You know. Like stage mom. Yeah, like the worst. Yeah. 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 It's a tiger, tiger dad. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, Indie Opera Podcast, it's David Cody, librettist, wishing you a very happy 10th anniversary. Congratulations. Uh, you had me on uh, a few years ago with composer Robert Patterson. We were discussing Three Way, our opera, which is composed of three one-act operas about sex, power, identity. Uh, in uh, 2019, I had an opera at Cincinnati Opera called Blind Injustice about true stories of wrongful conviction. That was with composer Scott Davenport Richards, with whom I'm collaborating on another piece. I just finished a micro opera with Nkiru Okoya. I'm just so proud that I get to work with these wonderful composers. I hope that we can get together in the theater real soon. Okay, bye-bye. Hey, Indie Opera Podcast. Just wanted to come on here and take a quick second to wish you guys a happy 10 year anniversary. I know in podcast world, that's like a really long time. So congratulations. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be on your show last year to talk about the implications of all the uh, COVID cancellations and how they were affecting artists and uh, our industry. So thanks for that opportunity and congratulations once again. Happy anniversary. Hi there, this is Robert Merrill from Rhymes with Opera. I'm one of the founding members of RWO and one of the current co-artistic directors. We want to wish a very happy 10th anniversary to the Indie Opera podcast. And we hope that you'll come check out some of our online offerings this spring. Uh, last winter and this coming spring, we are restaging Red Giant by Adam Matlock as an online experience in May. So for more information on that, please check out rhymeswithopera.org. Happy 10 years, Indie Opera podcast. I do want to know. I want to hear from you, Peter, and, and Noah especially, because like I want to hear about the history. I'm like I'm I'm new to this uh, crew, but this is tenth anniversary, tenth anniversary. So I want to know about the history. Like, take us back 
to Before Indie Opera podcast with Indie Opera Podcast? For me, it was just the fact that I didn't know anything that was happening in the new opera scene. I knew every time I heard about something, it was always after it happened. I'd find out, oh, look, this opera company just did this, and I always miss it. I just completely would miss it, and I didn't know what was going on. So I found that very frustrating. And I think the only way I could ever <laughs> learn this stuff is if I forced myself, you know, if I forced mm. myself to, to, to do it. And I'd been looking for like you know, a year or so, just thinking about it, but not do, doing anything too seriously about it because I didn't want to do it alone, <laughs> to be totally honest. And I wanted someone who actually knew a lot more about the subject because I was coming from not, not a place of ignorance, but I wanted someone who I could go back and forth with because me talking alone would be really boring. Um, and Noah and Brooke and I were all doing a production in New Hampshire of our town. Do you remember that, Noah? Yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you <he> forgot. <laughs> no, it's just, I, yeah. Noah was playing uh, George. You okay. thought he blocked it out. Well, <laughs> I, enjoyed it. I loved that. I had a great time. This piece had Thank all these you. multiple keys, and you just sang because George goes off in his own tonality while everyone else is singing. It comes something completely different. And yeah, Noah's a singer too. We we didn't you didn't introduce him as a singer. He's a singer. Well, he yeah, I'm a singer. I'm a singer. I don't sing anymore though. <laughs> I mean, you know, for myself, yeah. he's quite good. And one day we went to oh god, what was the name of that bar? It was in Peterborough, and uh, and we walk in, and of course, you know, on the drive up there, and I'd gotten to know Noah, and he knew a lot about, you know, German leader and all this modern stuff, and I was like, wow, this guy knows a lot, but we we're in the bar, and they were playing some I think it was punk rock or some something over the speakers, and you start you struck up a conversation with the bar keep, and I was like, he even knows about this stuff, <laughs> and you seem to be able to talk about almost anything musically, and it was funny. So I thought, well, maybe I'll ask Noah. So Noah and I literally we just For sat context, down. That show was in 2008, right before Obama was elected president. Wow, we were rehearsing. Well. Yeah, we were rehearsing and yeah. the giant, like 12 foot tall Obama puppet that the people were walking around. Yes, that's right. Yes. Oh. That's right. We were interesting place. <laughs> I was staying with my aunt and uncle who are like, still are conservative. So I went when he won and I drove home and the house was dark and it was like 730. I was like, oh, <laughs> bad news. <laughs> Everyone's like, we're going to bed. It's it was yeah. Grumpy, yeah. grumpy. So Noah and I got together and we literally said, I wonder if we could even get comfortable on a mic because I, I was not comfortable on a mic. I wasn't comfortable with my own voice. <clears throat> I'm, I think I have a weird voice. So uh, part, of, part of it, no, I do. I, 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 I was not comfortable with it. It's just weird. Um, we went to your apartment, right? And we just said, let's just record us talking and see how it sounds. It wasn't for a show, just to see if we'd be comfortable recording it. And it went really well right? And they said, let's just record a show. Actually, the first show was really different. Well, our, our first show, what we did was um, I, I went to, to the uh, Union Square Market and I just thought, I wonder what people would say if we asked them, you know, what? Yeah. Do you remember that? What, what is Yeah. What is opera? And my students, we got some of my students from the Bronx. Hi, I'm Noah. And I'm Peter. And this is the Indie Opera Podcast. On this week's podcast, we went out on the street and asked people the question, what do you think of when you hear the word opera? Glorious voices. <laughs> hey, have you ever seen an Good opera? stories. Yeah, not too many. Some. I'm a musician, so I appreciate music. My name is Abby Laquisha Jenkins Sindel. Okay, and you're a student at Junior Preparatory. All right, you ready? What do you think of when you hear the word opera? When I think, when I hear the word opera, I think of loud and commercials. Oh, commercials. Yeah, Good. because lately they've been using a lot of opera to advertise commercials and stuff like that for, you know, law, um, with some lawyers and stuff like that. Yeah. And, um, that commercial, um, 877 Kosh, no! Oh, Y'all remember the numbers together. It's still on. <laughs> They still have it on. Oh my God. <laughs> Interestingly, though, in that first episode, there were people who were like regular opera goers. So they had, you know, 
I thought, oh, are we going to find anyone? Um, and then we just started interviewing people. I mean, we did an interview on the second show where I tried to interview someone in a restaurant. I don't know what I was thinking. Mm. Um, and then by the time we got to our third show, it kind of made more sense. Uh, the show started with us recording on Skype. Remember that, Noah? That's right. That's yeah. right. And, and, and I was Skype. literally... I mean, and I you was, made me record my audio and then send it to you, and then you like put it together with gorilla glue or whatever. Yeah, Some sort of like yeah, audacity. That's what we did. Like real... That's what we did for the first four years of the podcast. Yeah. Oh, right. I mean, we were less regular about recording. It was like we would record a bunch and then we would not record anything for a long time. Mm. And then we would record a bunch and then we'd not record anything. And then we had a two year random hiatus from 2014 to 2015. <laughs> and then Peter and I were like, we should do more and so then we actually started making it a more or less monthly thing yeah COVID. but i was recording in my closet literally Great closet sometimes yeah. i would literally be on like like hunched over my microphone like this the whole time <laughs> wait a closet's a good place though a lot of people put like studios in there well the sound's okay. great and clothes clothes are great sound absorbers you know <laughs> My wife, my wife is a, a, an audiobook narrator and she used to narrate all of her audiobooks in a closet, in an actual closet. Mm -hmm. And then, and it was, it was, it sucks because it got really hot. And, hot yeah. You know, we had to put this weird like soundproofing up and it would flake off and like she'd breathe it in. Oh. Now oh. she's not, now she's oh. got this super swanky, like self-contained big studio thing in our bedroom. Yeah. So, Do you it's remember? very romantic so one of the right. things that really kind of changed the podcast was um when we when um Roy Spavard. Roy, thank you so uh we went to <laughs> see it's true we'd gone to a concert no you know actually it wasn't it wasn't um it wasn't Alice in Wonderland it was little one x because they did that prairie dogs on it <laughs> That's right. And he had done the libretto and they were sitting right in front of us laughing. So we introduced ourselves and he instantly was like, you need to talk to Missy Mazzoli. You need to talk yeah, to David Lynn. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. He yeah. sort of he And he sort of, called us the Indie Opera Boys. The Indie Opera Boys. We're like, oh, that's what we are now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that sort of started, that got us sort of an interesting role of guests happening in, a, in the show kind of took Here's off. Here's to there. Royce. Thank you. Here's to Royce Favrick. Yes. Now Royce has become literally the wunderkind of opera. I mean, he's written everything now. He did that great, yeah. um, he did the Kennedy, uh, the opera about Kennedy that uh, David Little did. JFK. JFK, yeah. He also did, um, he did one about Gertrude Stein. Um, Did he do Breaking the Waves? Yep. The waves? yep. Yeah, it's a pretty, pretty amazing guy. Did he do um, Vinkensport, too? Vinkensport. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That so we he, saw a prototype the first time. That's right. First that's one, right. one act of it or something, yeah. Um, no, it wasn't prototype. That was when City Opera was doing... Remember City Opera did new operas once Fox. a year? 
Yes. Fox. That's, that's what it right. was. I'm not saying prototype. Yeah. Because Vox. prototype started soon after the demise of Vox. But okay. we did we did go to Vox for a couple of years. Um, and then let's see, uh, Brooke, you joined us pretty early, right? Yeah, I think my first episode was in uh, November, December of 2011. So it was like six months in. Um, Welcome to the Indie Opera Podcast. This is Peter. And this is Noah. And I'm Brooke. Who, who's that? Who's Brooke? There's a Brooke. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, usually what we do is we talk about what we've seen. Have you seen anything recently, Brooke, that uh, you'd like to talk about? Um, I think the thing that I saw most recently was BLO's production of Macbeth, which was great. Wow. I, You know, Macbeth is tough because the music doesn't really go with the story. <laughs> so it's a challenge, I think, to produce. And then Walker, do you remember when you joined? I joined for uh, James Marvel. Was oh, the, yeah. I think I was like the 12th. Or twentieth yeah. episode, something. Yeah, yeah. He was he was directing Elio Gabolo, which right. was uh-huh. this really great Baroque piece they did at um. Like at a nightclub. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name. The book. The book. That's right. I was there. I remember thinking, Jesus. I came for the opera and seeing way more than I imagined. Remember back in. High school when you first heard of Salome, and the TV itself was like, oh, a naked lady, I can see some blasts in the album, by the way. That's why I was like, move over, Salome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's kind of, I saw, um, I saw Equus with Daniel Radcliffe. Oh, yeah. And That's I always would, I would joke around that like anybody who's like, oh, I'm going to see a little bit of Danny Radcliffe's package. It's like, by the time you get to the end of that play, you have never cared like, <laughs> less about <laughs> yeah. on stage nudity. Nudity <laughs> is good for ratings. And I think we should do an all nude podcast. What do you think next episode? Yeah, no. I think no. it should be nude for <laughs> everyone whose name is Peter. Everyone right? <laughs> <laughs> whose name is Peter. Yeah. I might not be wearing pants right now. I can like, I'm not. Like, I kind of believe you, <laughs> Peter. You never wear pants for podcasts. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, come on. I, well, I was going to say for me, because um, my my dad was an opera singer, so I saw opera really young. So for me, I think my first nudity was through opera, definitely. And I think, like, I can remember watching for some reason the Aida with Pavarotti, where there's like nude women in the in the baths, you know. And I just remember, you know, as like a six year old, just because mm-hmm. you notice it, you're like normal TV. Nickelodeon doesn't have naked ladies in an Egyptian bath, and this does, you know. And then I remember also like I, my dad got me a Ring Cycle comic book. The it Rhyme Babies had bare breasts though, and that was a big deal. Does the Met? Does the Met still do? I mean, they don't have any nudity now, do they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Oh, they, do? I, they, they, they always do the Met. I mean, for I remember I'm the tired. last striking nudity was um, when they did Moses and Aaron. That was like not just nudity, but pretty. Uh, that this the golden calf scene and Moses and Aaron had like mm. some really like almost I was like am I really in the Met like it was wow. Akhenaten you know. uh-huh. uh, he was yeah. naked in Akhenaten uh-huh. Uh-huh. yeah Anthony Ross Costanza was was did a whole scene he descended a staircase as a matter of mm-hmm. fact wow. Um, wow. but I think it, when they did the broadcast he actually wore something. So, the cod uh, piece. Yeah, when it was in the theater. Well, because, it, yeah. <laughs> I um, saw Giovanni when they did that, and I was, I felt like I, I grew up a little bit. She <laughs> 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 <You> did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so after Walker joined, then what, Peter? Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Yeah, the next thing, uh, the big step we made was moving to to recording in a real studio. I mean, we we and that forced us because you had to schedule a studio, so that forced us to have a monthly. This is when when we're going to record. This is so that really sort of made things roll 
you know, it was a good that motivator. The reboot. Yeah, the reboot. And and ever since then, it, w- it was going at a nice pace till COVID came and f- threw a wrench in it. But I love the idea that we're on video. <laughs> no, but it's actually kind of interesting because, you know, without performances going on, we've still had a lot to talk about. So, um, mm. and then the, the next big change was just, you know, we, we um, Gregory started writing for us about what, a year and a half ago? Gregory? Yeah. When, yeah. when, when did oh, you know, Chuck come in? 2015. At the it was the reboot. reboot when we at, at uh, Opera America. Yes. When I came in to corral the cats. <laughs> and then Greg was it really a year and a half ago and you were asking the way to things in the related for a connection and I thought and I was like um what did I have to say I it's my first old um I've ever seen I have no idea what I just saw. <laughs> I was confused. There was there, there was nudity. There was juggling. It went, on, <laughs> it went on before. I was like really confused. <laughs> Do you really want me to write a review? <laughs> and, and, and you said it's because it's your first of class open. I think you should. And I was like, okay, well. Oh, with, <laughs> um, the other thing though, you wrote a review of West Side Story, except you wanted me to, you saw a dress rehearsal. As it happened, it was it was right before COVID actually mm-hmm. hit. So I mean, God knows the fact it was never gonna come back. Yeah. And, I mean, it also was the you know we couldn't publish a review because you cannot review a preview because the show's gonna change. You know, so mm-hmm. it was like oh, well, can you preview a preview? No. Can you call your piece a preview? No, you can't. No, and then they've gone and screwed. They've gone and screwed it up because they set the end date for Tony um, Awards before the that show just had was about to open. Oh, that's right. And you know the the thing so, that kind of ruined it. Do you remember mm-hmm. Spider Man? Yeah. Oh my so, God. So Spider Man, American Treasure, guys, another <laughs> jewel. In our in our um in the, the American song, the American <laughs> tradition, it's like it was dude, Spider-Man. What the dark? Turn it off the dark. You, you, yes. you defame it. You defame it by forgetting its full name, Chuck. That was a fantastic show. Oh, Chef's Kiss. Wait, that wait. fantastic show. I thought. Sorry, I'm twice. Being... <laughs> I thought. I no, thought why? One oh, and the first time you were out. like, I'm not in enough pain. I want more. Twist my hair. Um, <laughs> it was really interesting how it developed from where they were and right. what they cut and rewrote. Yeah. Can I do an impression of? Can I, I do an impression of what I think that musical sounds like? After you know, is it like there's a lot of guitar that's like, it's like oh, I'm Spider Man, I'm flying on a band, and some chick. <laughs> Is it mostly like that for four hours? <laughs> Am I like that off? Chucking my way off? Uh, no, it's Jeez. just, you know, Julie Tamer really can't direct narrative. Mm. She, really she has can't. done it. She's done a bunch of things that are my favorite mm, thing that I've ever that. seen. A few things see? that are my favorite. They're okay, visually the, stunning. The DVD, the DVD that Julie Tamer directed of Oedipus Rex with oh, the that's Japanese awesome. that's, awesome. that's amazing. That's one of the yeah. greatest things like ever put on camera that is related to opera. And then her um, Titus, the, the movie Titus with Anthony mm-hmm. Hopkins, oh, uh, yeah, one of the best Shakespeare mm-hmm. adaptations for film. So, but yeah, I know she makes, and I know she does the Mortal Kombat ring and blah, blah, blah. But it's, you know, those two things, like good Julie Tamworth for me. Um, but my, my point to bringing it up is... Uh-huh. <clears throat> Uh, people yeah. reviewed it because it stayed in previews for almost mm-hmm. a year and a half. Mm-hmm. And it cost oh, yeah. a bazillion dollars. I was going to say, didn't the actual the person playing Spider-Man, wasn't he badly injured? At one yeah, point? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. 
So then, so then we, when we got into to COVID and um, the world was changing, um, you know, we've we've always had had a, an emphasis on what what was sort of new and, and interesting. We really didn't focus a lot. You know, you we didn't review the two hundredth performance of La Boheme, or you know, it's not that's not the kind of podcast we've been. Um, and so a lot of our guests and Brooke brought this up at, like when we were doing our reboot about, you know, we need to have more women on. Um, and we, we, while we had, I thought quite a few women on, it was, it was like 40%, right? We did, we did, but it wasn't intentional. It wasn't, it wasn't a good intentional. choice. It's just what happened, which is yeah. good. Yeah. But I think I pushed for more intentional choices. Right. So we started, you know, being more aware of equity, diversity, inclusion, and these things, and, and, and just started bringing in a, a wider, casting our net wider, making sure that we're th thinking with a bigger net, you know, and we started doing the women's composers things, which um, uh, Opera America had been sponsoring, which end up being such great shows. Um, and and I just want to say that was me pushing. Yes, yes, that was Chuck. <laughs> that was Chuck pushing, that's for sure. Credit where credit is due. Yep. <laughs> Give me my roses. <laughs> but, but, you know, I had not chosen guests with intention. It was merely like a kid seeing or a bird seeing a shiny object i would just see something and i would go for it brooke brooke definitely brought more intentionality with our our choices for sure uh, so she deserves a lot of credit for that too i mean uh, I, i'm very intentional it's very i'm a very intense it's i'm too much for myself a lot of the time so <laughs> you're intense you're intense and you're intentional intentional yeah. Oh, okay. And we also, <laughs> for a while, Brooke was surrounded by, as you can see, all these men because Ashley Renee wasn't here. So it was like, you know, four a lot of, of us. A lot of dicks in the room. The sausage party. <laughs> the sausage party. Yeah. So Brooke felt that, you know, we should, we should have a woman on, the, you know, another woman uh, co-host. And so we sort of cast around and she mentioned Ashley Renee. Um, and and Ashley graciously has joined us pretty recently, uh, but has already completely changed a lot of, of how we talk. And and you have didn't oh, you bring our last? Didn't you bring in our last guest or was that Brooke? Jeez. No, I brought, brought an Afton battle. I brought an Afton battle. Yeah, yeah that see? was a great episode. That, that was. was a great episode. Yeah. yeah, I'd love to know if there are some affirmations or if there's some internal sort of dialogue that you have that sort of keeps you saying i'm gonna go for these leadership positions and i i belong what can we say to these aspiring um leaders of color bipoc leaders that is a really good question i said to myself going into this journey for this job i am more qualified than the average white man period. That's it. Both of my degrees are in vocal performance. I've had a semi-relevant career, but my resume alone is better than most average white men in this industry. Well, I mean, we, I chose Ashley Renee with, I mean, she's a beloved friend, but also because I knew she would bring a voice that we did not, a perspective that we did not have. Ashley Renee, you have a very sort of thoughtful, your, your facilitation skills are, are, are very much appreciated. <laughs> Even though I think we think alike, Brooke, like, I think we're I mean, very similar. Yeah, but our styles are very different. <laughs> they are, ish. <laughs> you're, you're way more patient. I'm like, Bull in a china shop. And it's you... true. This is true. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to encourage Ashley Renee to to jump in and be more aggressive. I like think that. it comes from like being in the world. Like, no, I'm sure you can speak to it. Like, you know, when you work with kids a lot, there's a lot of like waiting and sometimes like that awkward silence where they're like formulating their thoughts and things like that. And so, you know, I'm usually screaming on the inside or like, come on. <laughs> but, you know, uh, it's like. <laughs> yeah. 
So I just want to say that over the sort of the change of the podcast <clears throat> from the beginning to now, um, I, I just really, I'm really grateful that we have such a wonderful, wide ranging group of artists, performers, thinkers who've joined us. Greg brings an incredible point of view. Ashley, Brooke, Walker, you know, Walker, is it? Hey, Ashley, my name. No, I keep doing Ashley. You're not going to uh, misbrand me. <laughs> Brand? It's branding? It's Ooh. a branding. It's a branding, thing. branding, yeah. <laughs> Renee. Mm -hmm. Ashley Renee. Well, I should, yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Ashley Renee. It's, it's, it's just hard for me. I'm old. Um, but <laughs> no, but I'm really appreciative that the, the point of view is very wide. And no matter what guest comes on, um, I think that, that we, we all attack them from very different angles and it's, it can be very helpful. Interesting choice of <laughs> word. <laughs> well, actually the funny thing is since, since we've had our full complement of co-hosts, our guests have been so effluent and so verbal that we, we haven't been able to get a word in edgewise. I know. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Afton and, uh, Afton and John was like, were like, oh. man. Afton and John both had a lot to say, which they were just like great. We, it makes our jobs really easy. Yeah, um, not yeah. mine. That's in the past where it's been like pulling <laughs> teeth, and we, you know, Peter is a brilliant editor, so none of y'all would know who are listening or watching. But um, there have been very challenging episodes to record where it was very difficult to keep the energy up in the room, and you know, we do have some sense of like what our audience is and what they expect from us in terms of irreverence and personality and fun. And sometimes people are just not fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> well, we've, we've had guests who literally would pause in the middle of a sentence. And was... My favorite, my, my, the guests that we had where um, we heard like a crunching sound and then oh. Peter was like, who's making a, and it was like, who's, is somebody doing something with the, and then, and then Walker, I think was like, it sounds like someone chopping vegetables. And the guest we had was like, oh yeah, I'm just chopping some vegetables. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> and it was like, oh. But wait, did he stop? Or did he stop? Yeah, he stopped. But why did he start? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, like, I yeah. Said, why did he, he start? Exactly. Stopped. But how did he not like go like I'm on a podcast? What did I say? The I'm gonna do the onions whole in this dish, you know? <laughs> Hi, Indie Opera Podcast. Uh, Daniel Rezasev Kabali, just here checking in with you all and wishing you a happy 10th anniversary and uh, catching up on what's going on with me and thank you for your support of my work. So. Uh, you, you all featured a project of mine that's ongoing that used to be called The Veil. We've changed the title uh, since then to um, Square, Triangle, Circle, or those three shapes, not necessarily those words, but the shapes, uh, a monodrama in three shapes. <laughs> and uh, COVID has slowed us down um, despite, uh, you know, our best efforts, but we're, we're coming back and we're going to have a workshop next December, hopefully, with Isuri Quartet and an unnamed singer. Um, my team is Amina Salepur, Yashar Sakai, and myself. Uh, and what else is going on with me? Um, I am being part of a residency with the BAMF Center right now. The, that's opera in the 21st century. It's virtual and then we'll move hopefully in the summer to the BAMF campus, working on a couple of new opera projects with them. And then uh, I'm gonna be a fellow uh, with uh, Cultivate at the Copeland House uh, this summer. So I'll write a new chamber piece for them. So that's great. Uh, anyways, all the best, and uh, thank you so much again for your support. And I'm looking forward to more with uh, Indie Opera Podcast and what's next. Thank you. Hey, Indie Opera, Mark Campbell here. Uh, uh, congratulations on reaching 10 years. That's an amazing anniversary, and uh, I'm very proud of our association. I've been able to come in and to your offices and talk about Elizabeth Cree and Aswan and Stonewall and. I'm just so grateful that you're here and promoting contemporary work, which is, of course, something that's that's very near and dear to my heart. Uh, happy anniversary, um, much love, and stay safe. What's happened in opera in the past 10 years? How much has opera changed in the last decade? Right. Noah, you're, you're a little more removed from the rest of us. What's your observation? 
Um, <laughs> I should just be honest. I mean, I listen. Here's the thing: I love opera. I'm enough. Like, I, I don't think I'll ever stop listening to opera. And I do, and I like new operas, but I feel a little bit like um, someone who like grew up with a parent that like taught them how to speak Latin, you know. And so it's like I grew up, and I'm an adult now. And I can like, I could be in the Latin society and I can read Ovid, you know, but outside of my Latin society and reading Ovid in my closet, it, it doesn't, it, to me, it's not alive. And that scares me. And I think, I think there's a lot of people who want to be optimistic about the future of this art form, but like, I have, I have misgivings. And one of them is just the suspicion that I have that it's a very old European art form and that if we want to have opera, that it's got to look very different, very different, and maybe so different that people who like opera now won't like the new opera. So that's why. Well, <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a good... It, it is, yeah. but I mean, that is one of the things that Prototype is about, and certain of the regional opera companies, like I mean, Opera Philadelphia, In is Memphis. really looking at ways to bring an opera Omaha, bring it out into the community and make it, and what is it, how does it relate to them? Yeah, you know, I do think that opera has changed in that I do think opera is gonna be a different thing. I feel like, you know, when you read in the history books, there's this, you know, there's this period and this period, and then they talk about that weird period in between. <laughs> I feel like we're in the, the transition, right? Um, I think that opera is in a point where it, it's being put in a blender with a lot of other culture and people are re-examining it. Um, and yeah, it is a European thing. It is, it's a European thing that we know as opera. Camerata and all that shit. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, I mean, when you look at this, what was this week at Met Opera streaming, Zeffirelli production. Yeah. Well, okay, so there's the Metropolitan Opera. Right. Yeah, that's. <laughs> and there's everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's just totally my, tone my, deaf. Mm, my, I, I think also that my, I wouldn't just extend my suspicion to the types of works that are being produced. Cause like one of the things I learned doing this opera podcast is that like if you like opera and new opera, there's a ton of it out there. And there's a ton of fantastic artists and singers who are all making these incredible new works that you can listen to in a community of about 5,000 people and enjoy in a very rarefied environment. And um, I think part of the reason for that is because there is really no financial capital in opera. Um, no one's making money off of it. And I feel like nonprofit art forms do get starved out, especially now that we see things like streaming video games and YouTube and, like, I just, I, I, I really feel like it's getting choked out, but being choked out can be a good thing. Like right now, um, really complicated literature has been choked out for about 50 years. You know, poetry has been choked out for a long time, you know, and people say like, oh, but didn't you see the inauguration, the inauguration and that fantastic young poet? And it's like, yes. And the reason why she's so remarkable to us is because poetry is dead, except that it like lived in her for one moment, you know? So I, I, I don't, I'm, very pessimistic about these things, you know? <laughs> Poetry is not dead, but capital and power and money and influence and argument and that stuff you is know, gone. I mean, we can like talk about capitalism and, and how problematic that is for anything that mm -hmm. any kind of art really. Even without, even without doing a critique of capitalism or if it's good, if it's bad, right? I think that Mark, let's take capitalism as that word out of it. Like market forces are not behind opera. Right. right. People, wait a do so, people do not gamble. People do not gamble. Wait a second. Wait a second. Speculatively, no. with opera. Sorry. At what point was opera? I mean, how long do we have to go back in history? Verity. Yeah. So, Verity. what is that? Yeah. Like. Late. Um. Well, I don't know. I think that's a good idea. I think the first Met. I think people paid to go to the first Met. I think the first Met probably was not insolvent I, I probably think they did not the first met you know did not rely upon a donor base I might be wrong I don't I think they did I think there was a star system in opera up until about the 60s I think that when Maria Callas died it was over and I think that's why Pavarotti went into the stadiums and sang for 
football stadiums and the three tenors and all that stuff. That was all reaction. You know, Pavarotti sold enough uh, albums to mm-hmm. save the wing of Sony Classical, to save the whole division, you know? And so, like, I don't know. I, I it, Again, like, we all laughed at the three tenors, but that's the most salient thing that's happened in opera, and we haven't had anything since. But, but I don't know, I think that with this question you can talk about so that you can talk about singers and you can talk about repertoire. I think it started to uh, lose its solvency um, around the time of Tordos premiere or whatever it was that that the composers started to get into really academic. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, wait, wait a second. So, all right, we've got Verdi, we've got Puccini, all right? Those are the biggies, right? There, it was alive then. Are we, do, are we agreeing with that or? or... Well, I, I mean, I, I think, think it was alive after that. I think it was alive, you know, in, I think Verismo. How, I think, how much yeah. does this have to do with our tax code, though, too, and the way that we like are distributing resources to the arts in the United? Like we're talking about arts in the United States. It's our, mm-hmm. it's, I think it's. I think we it, we've said it several times that it's been historically a European art form, right? But now we're literally physically not located in Europe. Um, And I think that we've, the art form has tried to ignore that here. Like it's geographical survival (laughs) here in, you know, in in the United States. Um, I think it's also an issue of just like sonic appeal. Um, And it, it's, I don't think it's dying necessarily. I do think it's evolving. And for those of us who, are sonically interested in the completely European approach, it's dying. But there are, there is, I feel like there is either needs to be or is becoming um, an acknowledgement of a wider palette of desire within, yeah. if you want sure. this art form to, desi- uh, to survive, then it needs to start to, to acknowledge the wider palette. The United States has had way too many musical art forms to come out of it for you to think that this European art form is going to survive among them without taking on some of those qualities. You just said so many, I think you said so many things uh, and they were also well said. I'm just, it just makes me think of like, if you think about jazz, which was something that was obviously it's, it's American, and we, it's com- jazz is completely institutionalized. But now. it's evolved. But jazz has been allowed to evolve. No, no, no. When I when I say institutionalized, I mean that mm-hmm. essentially it's almost impossible to have a huge like Taylor Swift, Mario Brothers, Coca Cola. Mm-hmm. I hate to say this, Trump style impact on the culture through jazz. It's like almost impossible. If you want to be a famous jazz musician. It's like the best you're going to do is, is like maybe you're going to be, it's just that the, the ceiling is very low on jazz, which is something. So why would we think that we would be any better to something that's not from our you culture? Blame, necessarily? I think you, you know? can blame opera for what happened to jazz. It was in jazz has become completely institutionalized and it became the thing that if you don't go to the opera house, then you go jazz has become elite. It has oh, I see what you're Yeah, it became, so we already had- oh, why? That's uh, interesting, but why- right, We already had like elite? this sort of like elite sort of uh, prototype, <laughs> as we've been using that word, <laughs> with opera. So it, the prototype was already there. So then as jazz started to pass through hands and move, I mean, you have to look at the cultural shifts that happen in jazz too. Like, you know, jazz was literally born on, on the streets. Right. And as it became more and more sonically interesting to more people, more people became creators of it as well. But those people didn't want to keep sharing it in the way that it was, you know, like when a a Louis Armstrong was coming up with like swing and like and, and things like that. 
And like really when jazz was being defined, it was more um, accessible. But when you get groups of people who start to be, it's just like what happened with opera. When you get groups of people that are already in their own exclusive silos, that become interested in a thing, then it becomes their thing. It's a specialization issue, right? Like Yeah, it's like a specialization, specialization issue. It's if you look at the technical language of yeah. opera, right? The technical language got went from Daphne, whatever the first opera, right? Mm -hmm. Which was probably only had like maybe some accompaniato figures and some maybe through compose, right? Like the technical part of it. Then you move into like uh, Bel Canto and then you have Mozart. Right. And then all of a sudden the scores are like Baird's, Wozzeck, holy shit. And then now you've got like now then you've got St. Francis of Assisi. Now, like things get more and more complicated. Now you could open up like a score to a modern opera and like not even know if you're looking. You could be, oh, am I looking at a diagram for the inside of a refrigerator? Like the technical language gets more and more. And that absolutely happened in jazz. Exactly. Right. Like the, exactly. the end of the end, quote unquote, of jazz in terms of its specialization where people like, uh, Ornette Coleman and Anthony Braxton. Right. And if you don't know who those, and Cecil Taylor, if you don't know who these people mm -hmm. are, that's fine because almost nobody does, right? And they're like the giants of this incredibly complicated, like I mean, complicated jazz. The same thing you know? is happening in hip hop right now though too. Like hip hop has become so, so complex. And so no, no, but here, no, here's the thing though. Hip hop is saved by there being a huge spectrum of kinds of hip hop. So you have like, the top 40 charts and you have the people that are like making the stuff that's making the capital and that affords you very small outfits that are doing very interesting dangerous things like zillakami or death grips or whatever things like right and so that's what we need this healthy it looks very unhealthy because there's a lot of bubbling garbage coming your way but it's this foaming fomenting um artistic situation that we don't have in jazz that we don't have in opera well, right? is, is your argument is still that of the people and for it's still for the people by the people I, I hip-hop things like there are still there are still underground world in hip-hop like absolutely all things like still exist and it hasn't been infiltrated by elitism <gasps> to the point where I don't know. what well, hasn't been no not in its entirety like it has not in its entirety no yeah that's like what makes it a healthy art yeah. form but it's you gotten still stretched have artists in. like you know you still have artists like a Kendrick Lamar and things like yeah. that that can who's very technical by the way but he but know? he but he can move. Like you still have artists that can, you know, the elements of it are in them. They can still do a freestyle. That's that's mm -hmm. not capitalization or anything. That is just something that lives within you. Right. Mm -hmm. Whereas in jazz, you have some jazz players that can't play it if it's not a chart in front of them or if there's no music in front of them. But then they're mm -hmm. that they're jazz players. It's funny, I was just doing some research on swing and I actually saw people trying to notate swing time, which <laughs> yeah. is not a thing. Well, many have like, tried, many, many have tried to Many do that. have tried yeah. because they've been trying to like make this Unsuccessfully, like a scholarly yeah. kind of thing. And it's like, yeah. it's literally a feeling. Right. And it needs to, be yeah. to like uh -huh. stay in the feeling realm and not become this, you know, technical theorized, but that's what has happened like to jazz. So as you keep adding all of these technical layers to it, you start excluding uh -huh. more and more people who just have innate ability in it, but they aren't legitimate anymore because the whole art form has now become some scholarly scholastic kind of thing uh -huh. so if you are just of the innate then you are not legitimate yeah but these i mean these these forums oh. started they, they were i mean they were losing yeah. popularity with the masses you know a long time before they became overly technical you know so oh, which one i think that's part of it too i mean the opera i mean like for instance oh. opera has never yeah, I, been I, I kind of agree i think i think it a lot has, of it, you know, I mean, it, yeah, in the united right, states like like you know opera has never been like the music of of young people well, that's the point know? like i think that's i think we're all saying the same thing it's like as you start to do all of this specializing and things like that it just starts to it naturally just excludes people like that i think that's the whole that's what i'm saying like, except, yeah. except, like, I mean, like, the, what hap what happens in really healthy art forms is that 
you have this landscape of works and there, there's things that are really complicated and there's things that are really simple and there's all mm -hmm. kinds of things. In between. I think what happens, and it, it, hap it, hap it can happen in film these days, mm -hmm. um, is that what happens is like something emerges that, that kind of satisfies everybody, that kind of links all of these disparate ways that you can do whatever art form that you're doing. And like Michael Jackson's thriller kind of unified everybody. And mm -hmm. even if you didn't like pop music, you might've bought that record. Mm -hmm. And even if, you know what I mean? It kind of had this pervasive, powerful thing that happened to the culture as a result of it. Mm -hmm. And I just think like, when you don't see those things happening, when you don't see these, award, these works, I mean, the last thing that happened in, in hip hop was the like to pimp a butterfly record. Like, I feel like that album, when it came out, it wasn't just like, oh, here's a new rap. If you like rap music, if you like hip hop, you're gonna like this album. It was like this album is yes, it won the exactly, and it was somehow something. And yet, if you if you sit down and listen to that album, it's very complicated. You won't get it the first time through. There's so, very challenging like poems in the middle of it. Like, very challenging. Kendrick Lamar was able to be a pop artist. Sorry, I'm gonna be finished soon, Peter. Mm -hmm. Like be able to be competing in a pop realm enough to just crack the ears of his listenership to stick something complex in. And that's the struggle that we want to see. And that's I what think, opera you know. can do. It has to go reverse. Like, who's, oh, who's the last think... person to do it? Terrence Blanchard is trying to do it. Like, you have, like, some newer folks that are trying mm -hmm. to figure out the, you know, what that local kind of, like, sound palette is. You have, you know, mm. you have plenty of people that are doing it but aren't getting, they're not at the Mets. And, well, now. Sure, 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 sure. Well, they yeah. Actually, yeah. it will be. Do has done some. Do Yoon has done some really interesting. Mm. The problem is that the opera is an elite definition for musical theater. We see. We, we yeah. wait a second. We go and see, we see films, and there are films that are indie films that are really high quality and out there. And then there are films like you know Superman. You know the the. Right. The great, but so no, that's healthy. Wait a second. That's a healthy right. thing. Yeah, but wait a second. The problem is, it in films we embrace that all because it's all being shown in the same theater, right? Mm -hmm. We see that you can see your art film in the theater, and you can see your regular film in the theater. Yeah. yeah. Musical theater and opera are the same art form. It is the same art form. The problem is that opera has decided to box itself off from the definition of musical theater. Music Broadway was doing incredibly well. If, if we let our brains encompass sung theater, it's sung theater, that includes um, Hamilton, that includes all these things that were, have affected the culture, that have huh? opera, op, the problem is we use the word So opera. pause, pause, I is Hamilton, is, is Hamilton an opera? Yeah. Is Hamilton Opera is just the exclusive form of musical theater. It's the art form of music theater. It is sung drama. There are some really, you know, you're saying that, you know, you have to have bad things bubbling up and stuff. There's great bad music theater being done. There's great. <laughs> the problem is, is that the box that everyone's calling opera is inherently exclusive. Same. I'm going to add a little, little kind of like, mm, in okay. <laughs> so, so the issue for me that I have is like, it's, it's, I keep going back to this idea of sonic appeal. So it has all of the same elements. Technically, you know, there's drama, there's plot, there's storyline, there's sets, there's, you know, and there's singing. But for people who do not connect with that much vibrato being used or with, or with that much, you know, head voice being used, that's the breakdown for me with opera. But I also say that there are operas, and to Noah's point, right now we're just talking about individual instances instead of a trend to open up the sonic and vocal production possibilities of what opera is and what it sounds like right. versus you know the elements of it and the elements of music theater. There is a huge argument going on right now, rightfully so, about whether opera singers, when they're coming out of conservatory and university, are fully prepared singers. You have so many opera singers that are like, I can't sing any other style of music as if it doesn't exist. And if it is, if, if, as if it's not legitimate because I didn't learn it in conservatory or I didn't learn it in college. 
So there is a, a, a wide conversation happening among conservatories and among colleges about expanding the vocal possibilities of legitimate singing. I was gonna say, it's interesting that you say that because you know John, our last guest, uh -huh. Um, has spanned multiple genres because he sings, I mean, he, and he sings with a totally legit operatic technique, mm -hmm. but it's connected to, like there's some, it's an intangible idea, but it's like this concept of it being connected to his actual soul or his actual physical body right. in a way that a lot of singers are trained to disconnect from who they are as humans. Mm -hmm. And so like my own personal journey as a singer has been finding my way back to my body I mean opera was not created it was created to be a storytelling device it was created to like express the human experience and like and give give a new perspective on what it means to be a human being but it as we've trained ourselves to this high level of specialization we've removed ourselves from the humanity of the art form mm -hmm. and I think it's possible to sing with a really legit operatic technique and still be grounded in your physical humanity in a, and so that what you do speaks to people. One of the people you're forgetting about is Audrey McDonald. Well, I'm, forget about I'm not forgetting about her. <laughs> well, but she's, she has been able to span both worlds. Sure. Audrey McDonald and, and um, uh, Kelly, what's her last Kelly name? Kelly O'Hara. Kelly O'Hara. Mm -hmm. They have so much command over their voice that they can mm -hmm. play with it. Kristen mm -hmm. Chenoweth. Kristen Chenoweth. Yeah. They can yeah. play with their voice. But I see that's, that's, I think, so like, there's a lot going on. I think the problem right now, going back to what you said about like undergraduates coming out of voice studios, is like there's a little bit of this attitude of like, yeah, you can do uh, like an encore at your recital of like an En Vogue song. That'll be cute, you know, if your friend arranges it. There's this idea that like you learn the high art and then you descend to the peasant art. Exactly. And then you go, but then really you're, but you're really legit. And even kind of in the way that we describe singers, I'm not, I'm guilty of this too. We will like, oh, you know, so-and-so, they sang this amazing, I mean, they have a really legit voice, but like you have to get that in there because it's really important to us because mm -hmm. there's this ongoing suspicion amongst classical music mm -hmm. musicians about like who's really a technician and who's faking it, you know? Yeah. Well, and what's, you know, what's kind of uh, stupid about that is that some of my favorite, favorite singers were, were deeply technically flawed. In fact, most of my favorite singers, you know, talk about Maria Callas or John Vickers, who yeah. sounded like a dead, dead horse. I would rather take those singers than Akiri Takanoa, who's always perfect, you know? When working with opera singers, I've never had any of opera singers say, oh, that's a legit voice. But when I've worked with Broadway people, yeah. when I work with Broadway people, they say, oh, well, are you looking for a legit sound? I'm like, what does that mean? I don't even- Do you have operatic- No, but I, I was- Yeah, yeah but I that's, was... that's the problem, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Maybe they were having this conversation, you know, in every century where you know now we label the music periods and, and maybe all of them were doing these great debates but i don't understand why the layering can't continue like we've had sort of like layering of music and we keep going back to these periods and then we we there is fluidity and moving around the periods <laughs> within opera but for, for some reason it feels like there are so many that want the layering of tradition and of shifts and of trends to stop and for it to just kind of like stay in this nostalgic right. kind well, of Well, you know, there was yeah, such a period where people, where performers literally could go from operetta to opera to music theater to, you know, and they, they, they and they should be able to. And they did it easily because they didn't they did not think that there was a difference in the styles there's no rule for that but it right. seems to me nowadays it seems to me that you're at, the most singers are way more equipped than 50 years ago to do all sorts of things like your average person opera singer right now who's 30 who's sitting on the couch is like mm -hmm. hell yeah i can juggle i can paint i can sing high notes like they, everybody's mm -hmm. overqualified everybody's oh. hyper specialized well, i think you know? it's I think that the, I mean, it has to be seen from like an industry, but also like a consumer standpoint is that that is what yeah. I ask for. I think it's only between 
coming back. I don't know if you um, saw um, that the uh, Glimmer Glass Festival a few years ago. They do uh, a children's opera every year, and it's typically a new work, but I remember a few years ago, they did one based on the Odyssey, and it was like Hamilton, you had a mix of styles, and they went from traditional classical um, operatic singing to a hip hop and laugh at all of these styles, and they did so seamlessly. Artists who are contracted to do a gig are going to figure out, most of them, are going to figure out how to do whatever is being asked of them. Artists who have learned to be both humble and hardworking, which is not something that you are taught in school, but it is something that... You don't need a degree to be a professional artist. What? You don't need a degree to be a professional artist. No, no, but you do need curiosity and humility and a willingness to try new things. If they're asked to rap, they will learn how to do it. They will find someone to help them. They will do it. The problem is not, I don't actually think the problem is with any of the artists necessarily. I mean, we're not trained, you know, you come out of school and you're not prepared. Like no one's prepared when they get out of school. But the people who are committed to figuring it out do figure it out. I think the problem, honestly, is with a lot of the funders who just want to watch Right. People sing Bohem every year. So long as we're chasing that sort of funding, we're cutting off acts. And, it, you know, it's much easier to get to raise $10,000 from one person than it is to raise $10,000 from a bunch of people. Mm-hmm. But if we, if companies make a commitment to raising $10,000 from a bunch of people and trying to appeal to a greater audience, it's going to be a totally different experience. But that is happening. There are a lot of companies now that are changing their conversations at the development level and talking about individual donors and trying to get smaller, you know, like wider spread donors versus keeping these old, you know, donors that are basically dictating Right. The whole shaping of the of the company. I mean, the collapse of Opera Boston basically happened because one donor pulled his funds because they because the company said they couldn't hire one artist anymore because she was ill. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of a company. Would we prefer that opera um, be publicly funded by donors? Would that be preferred? I mean, because to me, it seems like Hamilton made money, like made money. (laughs) <laughs> I think the, there is a problem with this discussion. I mean, okay, why? I mean, opera doesn't have to be football, okay? Opera doesn't have to be loved by everyone. The question is, is the culture alive? You know what I'm saying? I don't. I don't think it has. I to I miss be... fighting with you, Peter. Really no, no, that's good. It's good. It's good. <laughs> I'm just saying. But football, I think there's. A... But I think it should reflect. Maybe it can be major league like baseball. Yes, but wait a second. I, I think it needs to be something like that, or else it's going to die. No, I don't. I don't. And I actually think that human spirit wants to sing when we, I mean, I've said this before, when 9-11 happened, everyone now took out their guitar, lit their candles and, and started singing. When, when, Um, the Congress during 9-11 stood on the Capitol steps and sang, God bless America. People have this, even, even Congress have this innate desire to sing when emotion comes to them. It is part of our innate DNA. There's nothing that you can do that will stop people from wanting to sing and tell stories. It is, that is the way we live. The question is, it, you know, this particular art form, it doesn't have to be the top of the the most whatever. Is it alive? And for me, in the past decade, it seems much more alive to me now, now that even the Mets doing some stuff next year that that are really interesting, that I would never, they're doing two, aren't they doing two premieres next year, which I think is- They're doing three. Three. They're doing- Fire filled in my bones uh, and the the uh the Eurydice witch. Yep. Is that like Matthew McCoy? Oh, yeah. Yep. And what else? And then, and then doing a, a Hamlet by some Australian. All right. So the idea is that I I honestly have seen 
I remember a decade ago, some companies would do one premiere or might even do a new thing. And there was a handful of them that would do that. Now it seems like every single opera company, the big ones, the small ones, they, it must be a part of their season that they're doing a new work or they're premiering something. It is the DNA has shifted to be more current, more in touch of what's going on. And also because the stories that have been told for so long are frankly so sexist, racist, and weird that it's kind of getting painful to sit there and watch some of these operas. And I think they're looking for new repertoire. We are getting an American, rebirth of the American form of opera. Because right. it was very healthy for a period when people like Ford funding this regularly. I honestly think that now there are all these young composers. The Met is working with David T. Little. They're working with all these young new people. What with Janine Cesori and Missy Mazzoli? Because they were both supposed to be commissioned for this season. And Yeah, I don't know when that's going to happen. Well, but, you know, they were going to perform Missy's Breaking the Waves with the Met Orchestra and, um, and, over at BAM. And, and it was upset that they canceled that. Yes, yeah. and before yeah. it was Janine Tesori, they were developing a two-act version of her piece with Tony Kushner um, right. about the O'Neills. I felt very optimistic about the way things were going. Uh -huh. What's going to come out the other end of COVID? I mean, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it, they... The Met they've might got, not. They've got oh, time to figure it out. So something better come out of it. I mean, they <laughs> they are in some really, really terrible negotiations with the unions. And, oh. and the unions are correct. <laughs> um. <laughs> the Met to me is like the Met that the other normal people who don't like opera call the Met, Museum. right? Museum. The Met Museum. Okay, if you want to know about art, and artists that are happening now, don't go to the Met Museum. Right. Bad idea. You want to see some uh, knights in armor? You want to see some old art and a lady with her some nudity, right? Bring it back to the beginning. Okay, go to the Met Opera, right? If you want to see what's happening in art now, you have to work harder. You have to dig a little bit. You might have to go to a gallery where there's something amazing the next Whitney. to something that makes you want to throw up. Right, the Whitney though, but the Whitney is a museum, and I don't even just mean a museum and a technical like they're they're that stuff's dead. That stuff's dead. Like real artists, like real stuff is always happening faster than those institutions can document You're it right. and archive it. Hi, indie opera friends. This is Jonathan Blaylock, tenor and now full time fundraiser for the arts at Atlanta Opera. I wanted to congratulate you on 10 wonderful years at the pod. I enjoy listening to each and every episode. What I appreciate most is your authenticity, your humor, your willingness to shine a light on people that otherwise are sometimes overlooked, and just the way you're so real. It always is fun. The episodes fly by. I feel informed, entertained, and uplifted. I'm so happy for you that you've reached this milestone, and I hope that you have many, many more years of beautiful podcasting, producing, and lifting up important voices in the future. Hi, I'm Neil Gorin. Congratulations on the 10th happy anniversary of Indie Opera Podcasts. I remember 10 years ago when I was among the first people interviewed for the podcast, and what a thrill it was, and what a great time I had. I was asked such uh, probing questions and I was actually listened to for a response rather than thrown the next question. It was a great experience and congratulations again and my best wishes for the next 10 years. I remember very fondly my conversation with Jonathan Daylock and the whole team at Indie Opera about becoming Santa Claus a few years ago and I was so happy with how the whole team uh, tried to advocate for and explicate uh, contemporary opera, both for people who were already interested in the topic and for people who might have been new to it. It's great and witty and lively work that you are doing here, and I'm wishing that you have another 10 years. Okay. Okay, guys, we're we're gonna we're gonna do a we're gonna do a lightning round. Okay, and uh, I want people to jump in and 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 bring back some some juicy memories of uh, your your favorite podcast. 
one 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 thing that I loved was was Noah's um, culture bits, the, his culture bits feature, oh. and uh, one of them was the, the Lohengrin death match. Oh yeah, uh, I thought that was a classic. Do you remember that one? Kind of, yeah. My death match concept of of trying to you know pit all of the recordings of something against <laughs> each other until only one. <laughs> I think we should bring that back. That was that was a brilliant. No, I, I I think the height of Noah's culture was when he did. We decided to review that movie that was basically about shit. Oh, that was awesome! The, what the, movie uh, did I review about shit? The um, Barney Matthew Barney Matthew Barney's. Oh god! Basically, oh, it was a six-hour, literally a six-hour six movie about <laughs> excrement. Oh excrement. God. Who's got a favorite guest or a favorite episode? Um, my. I mean, my I, the guest that I remember the most is not my favorite. I I want to say I think it was Mohammed Farouz because yeah. I think he came he came to that um, podcast just really really angry about something that had nothing to do with us, and then he talked about something that I had like just read about that week. So I was extra opinionated with full of absolutely no reason to be opinionated. And I just, I just think we had this like pissing match. I felt this bro, <laughs> this anti right. antagonistic bro energy. It was a cock fight. Yeah. It felt like it, it felt like I was, I was like, well, yeah, well, I, like I was in fifth grade, you know, like, well, I have Super Mario Brothers three, the Japanese edition. Like I felt very, uh, <laughs> yeah. and then, and then in the end, when I listen back to it, I'm like, I, I sound like an asshole, and he's wrong. So I mean, who won? <laughs> no one won. No one won. That, okay, Peter. Peter, what's what's your what's your? Uh, I guess my favorite. I mean, episode? honestly, that I every time I listen to one, I go, "Oh wow, that was great." But uh, the one I really I just love thinking about was the M. Lamar. Oh, uh, I love that one too. That, because that he came in with these ideas about opera that made my head go like, "What?" <laughs> I'm, I'm curious um, about your, because we, we were talking about characters and, and your relationship with the audience. When you're performing, what do you ever interact with the audience? And, 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 do, you, and do you change character? In, 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 there, in um, I mean, I, I call what I do so do these, these monodramas or one person mm -hmm. uh, pieces, even though there will be an ensemble on stage with me. Uh, but generally, I think of them as monodramas like like Vo La Voyeur Man or, or Air Vox Tune, these Vox, kinds yeah. of like, especially mm -hmm. Air Vox Tune. I mean, I love that um, opera. Yeah. And I, I don't, I mean, the audience, I mean, no. I would say mm -hmm. no, I don't really interact with them. There's, at the very end of this piece, I sort of address them. Uh, I don't want to give it away. But um, <laughs> but generally, no. I mean, that what is going on is more about my own kind of, or the characters, I'll say the, uh, the, the character that I'm singing, their own kind of journey. It's not about... Um, and I'm playing the whole time too, so I'm, I'm not. Yeah. It, it's not like uh, uh, Evoxin where I'm on an actor on stage with mm -hmm. you know sort of blocking and that sort of thing. I mean, there's usually we um, at the very beginning of the piece when I enter, there's like a uh, that's a big deal, uh, particularly for this outfit that I'm gonna be wearing. We're having this like leather oh, cool. plexiglass thing made. It's, it's beautiful and gorgeous. So, I mean, it's a big deal, and there's like a coffin, and so um, so why perform for an audience? Um, well. What happens uh, for me? You know what I'm saying. No, I do, yeah. I do, I do. When I, I, um, I think that my position is that there are plenty of people who are out there, sort of like you know, teasing the audience and trying to entertain them or engaging, you know, sort of like flirting with them in some sort of way. Uh, I think that the purpose of what I'm doing is just not about that. I mean, that the, mm. the nature of my project is, is is about the music, is about the emotional landscapes that I'm painting. Um, it's not about. I mean, I think that. I mean, it is about communication. I mean, it's absolutely it about communication. Two, I mean, the sure. audience is a part it's, it's of it. It's kind sure. of, it's yeah, kind of like, uh, pull them I, who is the I'd media? like to think so, but I'm yeah, not, yeah. I'm not one to say. Yeah. Um, <laughs> someone else would have to make that evaluation. <laughs> okay. um, this... I'd like to think I'm engaging. For anybody who, it's episode 33. No, he was great. He actually was very, it was a wonderful yeah, he was, response. He was fine. He didn't really care. No, he, was, yeah. he was a great, at, he was a really good guest. And, I, and yeah. it just, because it made me want to just rip my hair out, but I loved it. I absolutely <laughs> loved having him on. Brooke. I, I, so there are a lot that I really like, but one that I keep thinking about is the one with Doug Cuomo, because we talked about, yeah. a, lot, about a lot of things. I remember talking about, um, well, he had this, production of one of his works in Nepal by a bunch of amateur musicians and he talked about that 
So you did. I was interested. You did um, Arjuna's dilemma in Kathmandu. Yes. Right? What was that like? It was I mean, crazy. It was actually Kathmandu. the most. It was the most meaningful experience of my musical life. Actually. Really. Yeah, and it, um, somebody just called me up and said, "We've heard about this piece," and this was three years ago or something. They called me up, and uh, there's a little theater company in Kathmandu, and we want to do it. Um, wow. And. In the first place, I said, well, how did you even f- know about it? He said, well, I don't know. The, w- the director's husband was in India, and he saw a magazine. I'm thinking, oh, oh you know, which, which all seems improbable wow. to me. But, um, and they're saying, well, yeah. you know, there's no money. And, and in Nepal, it's, a, you know, it's an incredibly poor country. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. Um, so there's no money, and there's no tradition of Western music. After the call, I thought, well, this is like never going to happen. He said, whatever you think is going to happen, like something else is going to happen. It might be better. It might be worse, but it's going to be different, it's whatever different. it is. And all those things were true, like whatever we thought was going to happen. So the whole time they're saying, well, you know, there's there's no strings, but I think there's a bass player. There'll be a bassist. Then a little before they said, yeah, well, actually, there's no bass player, but we have a string quartet. <laughs> um, wow. Which when I met there, were the, went there and met them, there were these young players. They're like 20. And they said, we were Kathmandu's we were, we were in Nepal's only string quartet. Whoa. I said, wow, how long have you been together? One month. Oh. <laughs> we joined four years ago. Yeah. And I just thought it, there was something so sort of soulful and kind and open hearted about him and also about the process that he went through. And then we also talked a lot about what opera is in the world in that show. And I, mm. I think about it all the time. Um, I also really enjoyed the the, the episode with Janine Tesori and Tadwell Thompson. Composers take note. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you draw from a lot of your own personal experiences when when you wrote it? Well, uh, yes, um, and some of those experiences aren't in the opera. Um, I do know that when it comes to law enforcement, when it comes to white police officers. I've had some very harrowing experiences. I've been stopped in my own neighborhood under the Giuliani administration, and I was, I had to, slammed, I wouldn't say I was asked to go against, I was slammed against the wall and frisked um, just because I'm me walking, you know, while being black. Um, one episode that really sticks out to me that's still painful to me to this day, and it's very difficult to me, to ride the subways. And I loved the subways, but I haven't been on a subway in a long time. I remember I was coming out of a rehearsal at City Opera, and I walked for a while, and I went down into the Columbus Circle uh, subway station, and I'm going through the turnstile, and a police officer signals to another police officer and then signals to me. And I looked around, and he says, no, yeah, we're talking about you, buddy. Get over here. And I thought, you know, clearly they have the wrong person. I paid my fare, so what is this? So they walked me to... um, a wall and said, show us some ID. And I said, is there something wrong? They said, just show us some ID. So I'm, I says, I'm, and I remembered, I said, I'm reaching into my bag. You have to say that I'm reaching into my bag to get it. What, you don't have a wallet? I says, yes, but it's in my bag. And so I, I took out my, and I'm shaking and a crowd is starting to gather and I'm going through my wallet and, and I'm, you know, and I realized I don't have a driver's license. But I have other IDs, so he says, do you have a social security card? And I thought, hmm, mm-hmm. that's not a form of ID. But I do. I have one. And I says, well, that's, I don't think that's what you want to see. Don't tell me what I want to see. So I showed it to him. So the other police officer said, no, we need to see something with your photo on it. So this time there were other police officers coming over. So I reached in and I realized I, I remembered I had a passport. So the guy's looking at the passport, looking at me, and then he says, how come you have a passport? And I said, well, it's a form of ID because I don't have um, a driver's license. How come you don't have a driver's license? Because I don't drive. So then the the other police officer's coming over and said, why are you down here in the subway? So I said, well, I'm... So it just, it went on like that. And um, another police officer approached. By this time, I counted at least six police officers. And another police officer came came into the mix who had a brain. Meanwhile, one of the police officers had his hand on his holster. So this man, this other police officer with a brain says, what's going on here? He says, well, this is, and he was whispering. So he said, the police says, this is not the guy. This is not the guy. This doesn't look anything like the guy. And he says, is everything all right? Saying to me, I says, yes, officer, it is. What was I going to say? 
So I said, no, you have sofas, everything. And, you know, and it's a crowd. And um, so rather than saying, sorry, we made a mistake, the last words he said to me was, the idiot police officer said was, all right, buddy, get out of here and stay out of trouble. Yeah, Um, yeah. Partly because Janine and I were like, oh, we're the same person. Um, but, But like... But also, like, she, both of them had some really thoughtful, really, like, amazing things to say about um, the world. And, and Janine gave me my favorite answer to the question of what is the difference between opera and musical theater? And she said, the size of the orchestra. Yeah, I love yeah, that. Yeah, very, very oh, clear. Yeah. Very, very clear. So, so yeah. <laughs> if anybody wants to, to, to check out Doug Cuomo, I came across him this weekend going through the PBS app, his opera Doubt. Oh, yeah. Yes. Is, is available because yeah. it was on oh. great performances. So if you want to see mm-hmm. his works, just log into PBS and or you can listen to Sex in the City because he wrote the theme song. He wrote the theme song to Sex yeah, in the City. Yeah, and he's still he's 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 churning out material. If I'm on his his like mailing list and he's he's putting out new stuff all the time. So and Doug, the, the opera four, just in case anybody 54. say the number again. Uh, Doug Cuomo is episode fifty-four and uh, the Janine Tesori is episode 60. Yeah, and Janine Tesori's, uh, we were talking about Blue, the opera Blue, which has gone on to have some really wonderful productions. And I actually think, yeah. I honestly think that that particular piece is going to become really important after COVID. I think you're going to see some good good resurgence of that particular piece because it really is dealing with issues of race and family and community that we're all talking about. Yeah, Ooh. Ashley, Ashley Renee, Ashley Renee, what's your do you do you have a favorite? That's my Dr. job to put you on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a favorite. I definitely used to listen like I was a casual listener to the podcast. I think I remember learning about like on-site opera, the company. Uh-huh. I can't remember what episode that was. And I was like, oh my God, I love this as a concept and like as a company. And then we went, Brooke and I actually went and saw a production. So they kind of like brought it on to fruition. But I can't remember what episode that was, but it was it was my learning of on-site opera, just kind of talking about how um, they kind of approach um, and put things in there their elements. So they, I can't remember what episode that was. They actually right now onsite opera is doing a tour of Harlem. I and, know. Uh, yes. Yeah, so Kenneth it's an, Overton. Yes. Yeah, so you Kenneth can download Overton, yeah. you can download the app and mm-hmm. actually do a whole tour of Harlem and listen to music associated to specific geographical locations. Mm-hmm. The onsite opera keeps, you know, changing the box. It's always They're a whole yeah, yeah, great, great group. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Anyone else want to chime in, Chuck or Greg? The episode that stands out to me is the one with Victoria. Victoria Bond. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it's probably because it's the first time I heard a, a female composer being interviewed. And I was like, this is kind of really cool she was talking about um episode 64 right episode 64 (laughs) and it was she wrote an opera about claire schumann she also wrote an opera about the first woman to ever run for president yeah yeah Yeah. was it called madam president mrs mrs and um there were some productions right after uh the show but uh victoria is also a, co- a conductor. I mean, she primarily got became famous as a conductor. And to the lecturer too. Yeah. And she was was the, wasn't she the first female conductor graduated from? Was it Juilliard? I think so. Yes. Yes. We talked about that on the show. So Walker, what is your favorite episode? Um, I think my two favorites were Emma Lamar and uh, and Stuart Copeland. I thought it was, oh, was yeah. really fun. That was fun, and I, I also love Laura Laura yeah. Kaminsky. Yeah, uh, yeah, she was just so gracious and so articulate, and just so many wonderful ideas, so knowledgeable about the whole industry. I just I thought she was a wonderful guest. She was very nervous, but then she warmed up. 
energy. It was great. So how did you see yourself at LaGuardia? Were you thinking Short, what you're going to be? Nerdy. <laughs> no, no. I, I, Short and nerdy. I played on the basketball team. Glasses. Did you really? Yeah, we never won a game. Oh. <laughs> and it's Oberlin okay. never won a football game. And, so. I, and I played on the Oberlin fo- uh, basketball team, did too. You, did you? And we never won a game. Well... <laughs> but did you see yourself as a composer? What were you thinking when you were as a Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. So I was going to ad- audition for the school as as a visual artist with a portfolio oh. and I was working on that, but I was already writing music for a few years and I was a kind of, you know, s- mediocre kid pianist and I started playing clarinet because in public school they actually handed out instruments when you were oh, in sixth yeah, grade. Yeah. And I got into the band and I started writing down music because I didn't really like practicing. It was much more fun to write things down that I made up. <laughs> so I decided at the last minute, I said, you know what, I want to audition in music because I, can, I have a solo piano piece that I wrote and a solo clarinet piece. So I could not just play the Brahms, but I could play something I wrote and maybe that would overcome the fact that I'm not the best performer in the oh, world. And I got right. in into the music program, even though I had thought I was gonna go in as an art student. At LaGuardia. Yeah. Wow. So. And, and at Oberlin, no, you went to the well, I, I, such a lovely human, like lovely a, human being, yeah, lovely person. Yeah. yeah, what I loved about her was that she is always works with these this these col- same collaborators, right? She works with Mark Campbell and Kimberly Reed. Kimberly Reed, yeah. that's right. I want to say my my favorites were Mark Campbell because he is so funny and will just say what he wants, and also the chance to interview Joseph Keckler twice, right. who is truly a unique presence and you did that down in, in Philly, opera. right? I, also, that- I want to give a shout out. Sorry. Yeah. I want to give it a shout out to Nico Muley, the episode where, God, what episode is it? It's 61, where I don't even remember what we were talking about. But I do remember talking about the bread and puppet theater and yeah, that's right. so hard. I mean, <laughs> tears streaming down my face like laughing so hard so that you know he's a, such a good guest he was yeah. amazing yeah, yeah he described a player in a baroque orchestra as a sex falconer start looking like a crazy person uh, yes <laughs> or what i what I, I this is so bad but I, what I, like if you have a million bags and things and things sticking out in a baguette and whatever you look like <laughs> chamber music enthusiasts yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. God, like I on the upper west side yeah. Yeah. Right. no like, i love i love the baroque the... musicians they're, they're they're like the the folk <laughs> <laughs> like the folk singers of the like classical a music with world. Like a, with yeah, a pret- a like egg cup somewhere, like coming out. <laughs> this woman is like this gigantic beret, or like like a like a Van Gogh like and country hat, cat, you yeah, know, like cat. It's, it's, like, it's so real. You crazy. should see. I mean, it, it, yeah. Yeah. I have a, I have a piece. I have a piece for um for Baroque orchestra, and you know, I've done it. 10 or, 10 or 11 times and every time there's a new like sartorial outrage I love it I know yeah. and, <laughs> and the last the yeah. last time because it's always like there's always that weird combination of like the renaissance fair and yeah. like bisexual yeah. swinging it's a or very, whatever yeah it's a very <laughs> interesting there was actually I had never I was I was not I was not ready for the guy who turned up I think he must have been the lutenist he turned up wearing homemade like leather trousers with like with like th- like this like suede trousers with like you know this yeah. stamped Stam- belt and whatever and fully barefoot <laughs> <laughs> directly off the yes. train directly off the train from Copenhagen walked through our house to the rehearsal fully barefoot dressed like like a sex falconer. <laughs> Like girls were not. I, I, I know those people. I know those people. No, but it wasn't like bread and puppet or whatever. Yeah. Oh, right. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Broke or. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. I mean, That's right. He, no, he's yeah. really brilliant. And we're lucky to have had him on twice, which is really yeah. kind of yeah. cool. So I, I want to thank everyone for, 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 for listening to our show and for really being with us the past 10 years. And we've really, I feel quite like. Quite a fucking decade, man. No. A lot no. has happened in the past 10 years. It just seems uh, like. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Both personally <laughs> and in the world. <laughs> yeah. So um, I just want to thank all, everyone who's, we've had people who've been tuning in since the beginning and, uh, and we have lots of people who are brand new listeners. And I just love the idea that 
that all these people watch John Holiday because he he's such an interesting guy. So watch it on Facebook. That's also another one of my actually the last episode was one of my favorite episodes. Um, uh, I just want to thank everyone for 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 listening to us over the past decade, and I really want to thank all my cohorts here who you can see on the screen. These people are all amazing. And my philosophy has been surround yourself with people who are much better than you are. So, and I feel like I've curated all these lovely, brilliant, amazing, talented, passionate people. And I, I'm just very proud of that. And I want to thank all of you, every single one of you. There are six of us here, right? I mean, seven, including you. Seven. Including me, yes. But uh, yeah. it's just incredible the amount of, of, of talent and passion. And I thank you so much for everything you do for the show. And uh, my God, I was going to say, let's do another decade. Oh my God. Can you imagine that? 20, <laughs> 20th anniversary? It could happen. That means you'll, you'll be 80 years old then. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Wow. Actually, I'll be uh, uh, getting up there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thanks, everybody. And thank you all for listening. Um, we're, we're trying to work a, a little bit on the show structure. And I would love to have some sort of a sign off, like, see you in the aisles or see you at the premiere. But I, I, don't, I know it's horrible. Right? <laughs> <laughs> see you in the aisles with your mask on. See you on the aisles. <laughs> So, so if, if you're listening and you want to help us and you think of a great tag, guys, a unique sign off. We need a sign off. Well, we so, write us at comments at indieopera.com and, and, and I promise you, I'll give you credit for, for writing our sign off. It would be lovely. <laughs> see you on the island. Uh, and Noah. with that, oh, good to see you. And no, Wait, yes, yeah. thanks so much. Thank you, Noah. Nice to meet you. Thank you guys for having me, yeah. Ashley and Ace and Gregory and Chuck and everybody. Thank you guys, yeah, for having me on Wait, to cool. hear your voice and, and argue loudly. <laughs> yeah, that's it's right. my favorite thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, everybody. Good night. All right. Awesome, Bye. guys. Good night. See you in the aisles. <laughs> <laughs>Hey, viewers, could you stop what you're doing and please subscribe to our show on YouTube? That way you'll be notified of all our new shows. And please select the thumbs up symbol for our show. It's a free way to show your support. If you want to help bring opera to a new generation of listeners, donate on our website, Facebook, or on Patreon for special benefits. This episode of the Indie Opera Podcast was recorded on Zoom with co-hosts Peter Zepp, Ashley Renee Watkins, Brooke Larimer, Walker Lewis, and co-host Emeritus Noah Lethbridge. Our show is created with the support of associate producer Chuck Sachs, Jonathan Blaylock, PR consultant, and Rosha Crean, who created our theme music, and Gregory Moomji, web correspondent. This episode was edited by Peter Zepp. Thank you for watching.